Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. This is episode 16, and I'm thrilled to introduce my guest for this episode, Dr. Madeline Fernbach, who's here to talk to us about gender, identity, and what it means to be our authentic selves. And I'm excited because Madeline and I are here recording in the same room face-to-face, which is a first for the Potential Psychology Podcast. Madeline is a clinical psychologist based in Ballarat in Victoria, Australia, with expertise and a passion for working with the transgender and gender-fluid communities. She sees people face-to-face individually and also facilitates clinical support groups, as well as delivering training on these topics to other professionals. Welcome, Madeline. Hello, Ellen. Thank you very much for taking the time to have a chat to me today about gender and identity and other exciting topics that we're going to cover over the next little while. And I'm interested to know, firstly, you do have a particular interest in identity and the way that we see ourselves. What does that mean to you? Well, I suppose it came from, I think in high school, I I never quite belonged to any specific groups and I wondered why that was and I think it sort of came from there where I floated to this group and floated to that group and didn't quite belong until I found a a posse of friends, something Mm -hmm. like that. And I guess that kind of grew over time into really starting to ask questions in that more formal way. Um, I did my PhD on identity try to get a sense of understanding what it is to, to know who you are and, and how you connect with other people in the world. So I suppose the, the thing that I find most easy to describe it in is in terms of a, a lovely theory called social identity theory, where you have, if you imagine an onion where there's a, a core self, if you like, which is kind of the secret self of your own that you don't tell anybody else about. I think Billy Joel had a song called The Stranger, which had yes. some of those uh, <laughs> I know lyrics, well. you know, we all have a face that we hide away forever and we take them out and show ourselves when everyone has gone. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Thing. And, and that to me is the core of an identity. It's a very secret part. And then the, the closest ring around that would be uh, the most immediate personal close friends or experiences or, or, or parents around that's very very secret that people only see when they know you inside out and then there's another ring outside that which might be really good friends and there's outside that the people that you work with which you who you really like and so on and so go so forth it goes so each one of these rings kind of contributes a sense of who you are and your place in the world by you belonging to different things you belong to groups and you belong to a family and you belong to a particular gender and those sorts of things yeah, so that's kind of where it came from. I was particularly interested in what happened when people entered groups and belonged there for the first time and also exited groups. And I'm sure that has something terrible to do with my psychological <laughs> upbringing as a, as a teenager. <laughs> that's, so, so it's born of personal interest and then you kind of took it more in an academic you know, really that sort of, I suppose, love of learning or, or pursuit of, you know, wanting knowledge and understanding that helped you build up yes. a picture of, of your own. And I love that onion type idea because I think that is so true. I often think about that in terms of my work persona. You know, I feel like I have this professional persona, which is still me, but it's it's not the same me that my yes. children would see as their mother or my partner would see as someone who's able to just be relaxed and be themselves. Yes, it's, at it's home. in some ways it's not a mask as such, although some people have a mask for for their workplace. Mm. Um, but it is a different. Uh, it's a more public face. Mm. Yeah, mm. I really like uh, sometimes in my therapy work with people, I, I talk about the Wizard of Oz, and um, some of the young ones haven't even heard <laughs> the Wizard of Oz, but uh, most people do. And that idea that um, the Wizard of Oz, when finally Dorothy comes to see him, is um, like this big, all encompassing, all powerful man with smoke and booming voice, and all this sort of stuff. 
but actually he's just the man behind the curtain mm. playing at being this this figure and um, he was quite a nice man by the sounds of things quite humble and such the one that was behind the curtain so yeah so there's a, a persona that we present to the world that isn't necessarily all of who we are although it's probably part of yeah, 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 and I think there's there's some chance to, to to try to be as authentic as possible. I think it's all very well, and, and there is a really important part, of, or I suppose it's important for people in a workplace to have their their, their public face. Mm. But the closer it gets to who you really are, the more authentic you are in a way. The less I'd call it, it's a technical term, cognitive dissonance. The less difference there is between the public and the personal, the, the better it is for mental health. And I think this is where we come into the gender stuff because if someone's public presentation is of a particular gender and secretly inside they have a different one, there's such a difference between those mm. two things and we'll talk about that I'm sure yeah. later on, that it really does cause um, quite a lot of mental distress yeah. for people. Yeah, that's mm. interesting. I was actually having a conversation with somebody yesterday about this notion of dissonance and this idea that having to behave in a certain way if it's not authentic to who you are or what you believe and how that is so uncomfortable you know that, that that's a place that really is hard work and yet yeah, from a mental health perspective can cause distress but even we were talking about goals and the idea that sometimes we have these kind of should goals this is a goal that I should achieve because society tells me I should or because my boss tells me I should or because my parents tell me I should you know I should pursue a certain career and if it's not authentic to us if it's not really valued um, by us at a deeper level that that is just well it just makes it very hard to find the motivation aside from anything else but yeah. it can be really really uncomfortable and I think that's an idea that we don't discuss very often out yeah. there in the world that that you know and, and that makes sense from a, a gender point of view. I think that's one one thing and it really is an important thing to balance. The, the other I suppose the other end of the spectrum is if someone doesn't have um, a sense of what's appropriate for their private life and what's appropriate for their more public persona and such like in fact they have quite poor boundaries between the social and the personal then that also can generate problems because people are kind of just bleeding out their uh, the innermost stuff to anyone who will yeah. be available for yeah. that and you know that's exhausting as well, as there's, well. No, there's no sense of containment and safety yeah in yeah, yeah. Which is a bit like, yeah, when we're teaching our children, our small children, about what's kind of appropriate behaviour yeah. <laughs> out there in the world versus, yeah. you know, in private or, or at home. Yes. Um, so, right. yeah, perhaps not. It's like, Mummy, why is that woman so fat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can't actually say that. And <laughs> yep. a two year old can get away with that. Exactly. Like, oh, you, you've got to, yes. But if people don't kind of learn those or, or don't find a way to manage those sorts of boundaries as adults, then that's making situations difficult. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is. Okay, so specifically with regard to gender, we talked a bit about gender and identity, but can you just explain gender diversity as a concept to mm. us? Because this is something I'm kind of, it's a little sad to say, I have a background in, in individual difference, so understanding people as pretty much every characteristic I can think of existing on a spectrum. Yeah. and. I've done that in terms of personality and understanding sort of personality characteristics and our strengths and all of these sorts of things, how we're all unique and different, wired up differently. And it's probably only been relatively recently that I've thought about gender in the same way. So can you tell us a bit about that sure. idea of gender diversity? Sure. Well, when we think of the word gender, I think a whole uh, bunch of in in images come to mind. Uh, we're taught the idea that everyone's born either a boy or a girl and when someone's um, had a baby, oh is it a boy or a girl, oh, congratulations it's a boy. And so from that sort of moment or even before uh, beforehand when you see the, now I've, I saw one yesterday, a, um, a Facebook post of somebody's uh, ultrasound oh, where they yes, were saying yes. this is our son who's about to be born yes. in five months yes. time or something like that. Um, so we're sort of expected to identify in a certain way based on what's between your legs, what you're born with mm. in terms of your biological sex. But actually that's not true for everyone and uh, it totally ignores the, the huge amazing world of the, the 
difference and the, the range of things that go on, the trans and gender diverse stuff. So gender's part of a, a person's internal sense of self, who they see themselves, back to that core we're talking about of you know who they really are. middle of the onion. Mid exactly. <laughs> And that can be female, um, male, neither, or a combination of, of both, really, um, or exist completely outside of that whole thing, not, not buying into gender at all. Mm. And some people get called uh, or identify as agender or, or without gender. Mm. Uh, a person's relationship can with their gender can change over time as well. And uh, again, that kind of depends on hormones and it depends on your, where you're at in terms of your developmental stage as a, as a child or an adolescent or an adult or so forth. Uh, so we're assigned a gender when we're born, it happens, you know, when, soon as it, soon as the person's out they've got a blue band blanket or a pink yep. blanket. Fortunately we don't, we're not quite so, um, so tied up with that. But uh, I suppose you call gender and gender diverse or trans for short for the transgender is when you don't exclusively identify as the gender you've been born with. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And that is about that core identity, that sense of who I am rather than what the world is maybe telling me I am. Yes. And look, our, our brains are wired to choose binary options. We are chose, we choose male or female and when there's something that is neither male nor female, our brains have to do a lot more work. And so that's when somebody will, be, will, become, will reach our notice in a way because, oh, are they a boy or a girl? And you hear that. Yeah, in yep. Kmart when yes. a, a little kid says, no, yes. is that where we go? Yes. The, the challenge is that people do exist in this space and that the, the thing that they've been born with causes distress in terms of that, that difference between the two. Those gaps. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think you're absolutely right. We want to be able to instantly make sense of the world and if we're presented with a situation, perhaps a, a a person's appearance that we can't immediately make sense of, yes. that causes confusion, you know, yes. it causes us an, an element of, I don't know if distress is the right word, but certainly an element of kind of stress in terms of, I, I don't know how to make sense of this, this yeah, and we can is not all the effort, we can call yeah. it effort in a way too, um, and that's got nothing to do with values, it's about your brain is wired to do this. Of course you can rewire these things, you can in, introduce into your brain the concept that there's uh, a spectrum. There's mm. a range of options and there's a lot of options that don't fit neatly into those mm. categories of, of male or female. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's what got me thinking at one stage about because I, and I'm, I'm going to ask you in a moment about the, you know, what gender actually looks like and all the different ways of thinking about gender, but for me, I grew up, as I said, but for some reason my family's always talked about people's strengths and their abilities and the fact that these are all different. I, I don't know why, just it's just why part of our psychologist. It's possibly why I'm a psychologist, yes. Um, it was just part of the conversation that we had growing up and, and um, I have, uh, my dad uh, has these incredible strengths in areas that you wouldn't consider to be typically male. And yep. I'm saying that in inverted, yep. you know, fingers doing the inverted <laughs> commas for, for those of us listening who can't yet see me. You know, he, he loves novels and he's very skilled in terms of his written communication, all these things, you know, he just, you know, you think of blokes don't read books, well, dad's always read books, I don't know why we think this, but it just seems to be one of those stereotypical ideas. I personally don't think that I think, again, in a stereotypically female way, I tend to be far more analytical and not necessarily... I don't know, I've just noticed you that... Don't you don't read new idea. I, well, I certainly don't read new idea and do those sorts of things. But yeah, I, I just don't... I've always felt that I think more like a male. I don't know why I think that. It's just something that's... Well, we've got to factor in that we're in Australia here. Mm -hmm. um, Australian society has a particular set of cultural stereotypes. Men don't read books. Yep. Women don't get interested in politics, yep. and so it goes on. I won't go into all of yeah, the, the yep. horrors that yes. can, can be there. And you know, most men are not in that stereotyped. Um, they don't. That's not what their wiring is yeah. about. Yep. Um, and women, likewise, there's just as many women who are interested in mathematics as there are in terms of their natural state, mm. as who are interested in the new idea. Mm. But 
we we want to belong and it goes back to the social stuff mm. about our identity we want to belong to groups and our culture having been brought up and developed in that way um, gives us uh, kind of guidance about how we have to kind of mold ourselves to, to be it and I do see people here who uh, men who really struggle with that sense of I actually really try hard to behave like a tradie mm. because I'm a tradie mm. and I like doing stuff in mm. my hands mm. but I I also really like knitting yeah yeah you know yeah 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 and yeah, I suppose, and I suppose that is, you know, just as you're saying that, I'm thinking, well, that's, you know, I suppose that, again, that gap between what you think something is, because that's what society's told us it is, or that's what our family expectations are, or I don't know, whatever, you know, those uh, forces that shape our ideas about things versus your own internal experience of something and where mm. that gap and, and you know, my gaps might be minor but for other people those gaps could be quite yes. significant and you take gender into this imagine then that you've got somebody who um, was born with a, a biologically male body but as a even a toddler they were more interested in dressing up in a little mm. frilly tutu oh, with a playing with dress. dolls and yeah. all of the stereotypes yeah so they're absorbing the stereotypes um this in this particular case um the the female stereotypes but being brought up then, saying, oh, well, I've got um, male genitalia, so yep. I'd better start playing with trucks or I'd better yeah. join the football club. or And so that there's a lot of pressure, but also picking up the social cues of what it is to be a boy mm. so that when someone decides way down the track, actually, no, um, this is genuine gender dysphoria. I identify as a woman. Yep. I want to be a woman. They actually have to unlearn all of that yeah. um, training that was, you know, that was about what makes it all those habits and Australian man kind mm. of profile, mm. and have to learn the the, the female ones, mm. which is incredibly difficult. Yeah, and, and lots of disruption in thinkings and feelings and everything mm. that flows on exactly from that. So, can you tell us a bit more about this? I know I, I remember I saw you speak um, at a professional development thing a little while ago, and you introduced us to the gender bred person, <laughs> yes. which I just thought was wonderful and I will put this in the show notes for people because Madeline's actually got the picture here in front of her but you guys can't see that. Um, so I will link to this in the show notes so that people can see it. But can you describe for us the gender bred person so that we understand yes. a bit more of the complexities around gender? So if you can imagine a gingerbread man. Um, gingerbread, of course, you know, with the little current eyes and the, the round fluffy hands and yep. the feet, and little buttons down the front. So that's the visual is about, basically looks like a gingerbread man, but of course it's not a man, it's a person. The, the first part of this is a description of the biological sex, what person a person has been born with in terms of their um, sexual characteristics. And that is... It's pictured there as a, a, a little bit of a uh, one of those male, female, and intersex um, symbols Double there. Symbols, yeah, yeah. And so people are generally and mostly born either with male or with female characteristics, um, or with a combination, and particularly with some genetic uh, conditions. There, and there's um, intersex where they have can be born with a combination of yes. male and female genitalia. Really, yes, yes. and that. Can also be chromosomal differences yes. as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so exactly. you don't necessarily. We kind of, or well, for those of us who've done the genetic type stuff way back when, your male is an X Y, female is yes, a yes. double X. But there are some people who have. Double XY or well, they some, be, or some sort of combination. Yeah, they can yep. be XXY or um, XYY. Yeah, yep. it just depends on what um, little glitch happened in the very early stages. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So that's the biological sex. Then we're talking about what's in your brain, what's in your, um, your sense of identity or your gender identity, and that might be identifying as a woman or as a man or having quite a lot of womanness and a bit of manness or a bit of womanness and a lot of manness or neither, nothing uh -huh. of either uh -huh. um, or very little of either and so that gender identity really does assist people to have a sense of who they are as a, as a gendered or non-gendered person so okay. we can find ourselves kind of doing gymnastics here, this is where we start Yeah, and, and hopefully this doesn't twist you around to feel like you're doing those gymnastics. Yeah, yep. so that's about 
yeah, that, that feeling. And I suppose we do talk in sometimes in those terms about people being girly girls or blokey blokes yes, or, uh, yes. you know. And you might find that for you when you were saying, actually, I, I wasn't, I'm not that interested in the girly kind of mm, stuff. Mm. My identity might have quite a lot of womanness, but it might have a bit of manness in yeah, there as well. Yeah, which I think it does. You know, I, I think I dress femininely and I'm interested in a lot of, you know, stereotypically female things. I've just found it harder at a social level to relate, I suppose, to a lot of the things that I found my peers talking about or worrying about. Yeah. I was kind of like, why on earth are you worrying about that sort of stuff? And, yes. and felt that maybe that was more of a male way of thinking. Yeah. Which is yeah. why you're a psychologist. Which <laughs> <laughs> is going to be a thing, isn't it, today? Yes. <laughs> so that's those two. And when you have a dissonance or a distance between the, the sense of identity, who you believe yourself to be, a woman, and what you were born with, a man's mm. genitals, then that's where you start to get some mental health issues mm. um, or some distress. The third thing that can actually help or hinder this is your, your expression of gender, how you choose to behave, what sort of clothes you wear, uh, what your mannerisms are, the way you speak, the, all of the sorts of things that are incredibly changeable, you can mm. choose to change them like an mm. instant and I don't, don't know about you but I'm terrible at accents. Um, that some people are amazing at taking on a new accent mm. and suddenly you can hear a parody of one of our politicians or you can imagine that, oh, I think Magda Zabansky is amazing yes. for that sort of thing. Yes. Um, that expression of how you choose to, to be mm. uh, in public, there it is again, that yep. the, the leaves of the onion, that can help or hinder. So biological sex, born a man, learning to be a man and expressing as a man but this gender identity in the brain saying no 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 this is not right this for me right. Yeah. then um, the first step for a lot of people is to choose to change their the expression of, of their agenda um, the way they choose to behave think act all those sorts of things mm -hmm. and wear mm -hmm. what and dress yeah and dress yeah. thank you so that's all there the final bit of the gender-bred person, I always see it as an afterthought, which is um, attraction, what's in the heart. Uh, because you can be attracted to men, you can be attracted to women, you can be attracted to either, you can be attracted to neither, yeah. you can be attracted to both, and any combination in between, and there's a, a million different terms for all of the ways that people describe themselves in terms of that sexuality. Uh, but that's in some ways independent of gender. And this is why with the LGBTIQ+, whatever, yep. you know, the rainbow, I, I do struggle sometimes with that because it assumes that being lesbian and gay and bisexual is sort of in the same um, group as being transgender and intersex and, uh, and gender fluid. Those two things are really separate, separate for me. Things. Yeah, it really muddies yeah. the conversation. Mm, doesn't it? It does. It mm. does. And yeah, you find that people who um, who are in the LGB kind of part of that aren't necessarily any more understanding of what's going on for gender and mm. transgender than the rest of the okay. population. Yeah, interesting. Because mm. I, I suppose if and whilst there would be, I can imagine. I like to think I can imagine <laughs> struggles with identity, perhaps for somebody who is coming to terms with their sexuality or perhaps their sexuality being something that they didn't anticipate it was going to be or that other people didn't anticipate it was going to be. But it's still, when it comes to identity, perhaps there isn't necessarily that same discrepancy, if that makes sense. So, you know, I, I am a gay person and I'm comfortable with the fact that I'm a gay person and I've found my community and perhaps that feels more solid. I'm not saying that there isn't probably all sorts of challenges that mm. come with that process, but for somebody when it's around this gender identity issue. You know, if we were having this conversation 20 years ago or 30 years ago, then we might be struggling with the being gay, being mm. Um, mm. lesbian, and we don't do that so much anymore, anymore. because it is so much more familiar to people. Mm. And I think uh, in in 20 years' time, maybe, or maybe 10 years, who knows, it'll be happening pretty quickly, <laughs> I have to say, um, that gender might actually be as understood as being gay or being lesbian. Yeah. But at the moment, what happens often you know, for teenagers, if they identify as having um, a, a gender difference, 
uh, they can often come out to their family and friends as gay first mm. and then get them used to that idea that I'm different from the, the norm, if you like, or, or the, the, the masses. Um, and then once people are used to that, then they say, actually, no, here's the next step. I'm transgender. And I actually wonder, and in preparing for this interview, I actually watched um, a wonderful video with a woman um, who had grown up as part of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints but she had been born a male and she'd identified as female very early on, so this was her journey. She's still only young. Um, this had been her kind of talking about her journey and she had these wonderfully, incredibly supportive parents um, and it was overlaid with some of the beliefs of the church and, and trying to kind of still remain within that community, which was really important to her family. But she'd been, she described exactly that, that at some point, I think she even felt, and I will link to this in the show notes for people who are interested in watching, she even felt that perhaps I am a gay male, perhaps that's what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, as she kind of went through this process of self-discovery and I think, you know, the way she described or certainly what came across to me was that at some level she kind of knew that wasn't right, but it was trying to work through this process of working out who she was and what other people might have wanted for her. So yeah, she went through exactly that, I'm a gay male and then it was like, no, actually I'm not. I'm, I'm and I think that goes back to the gender bred person thing we're talking about too. Um, it's not, some people know from very early on this is not the right body for me mm -hmm. and other people say there is something different in, in terms of I, I, I don't feel like or I don't identify as what I'm, what my biological body is mm -hmm. telling me or, or what society is telling me. So there, there can be differences and in, in discord all, all over the place. Mm. It might be a, a case of, of discovery. And I think that's one of the things that happens often here is people come in and I'm saying, I have some sort of gender thing going on and I don't, <laughs> don't know, know what, what it is. is. Yeah. And so that's, um, and then I whip out the gender bread person yes. because that if someone wants to have a, a, a conversation about it but doesn't know how to have that conversation, mm -hmm. then we have a lot of people who don't know, don't have the language for it, they don't quite know what's going on, then coming out with the gender bread person here, here's a picture of a person and this is all the things that might possibly be going on for mm. you, um, do you have a sense of where you might fit? Mm. And mostly people have more of a sense, oh, well, it's more like this or that. Because we're giving them a language, aren't we? And yes. a bit of a model that they can use yes. to yes. understand it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's what I loved about it when I when I first saw it, when you showed it at that um, professional development session, was it was really un helping to give us a bit of a model of the complexity of these things, that this is multi layered that it does have to do with in a sense of identity plus physiology plus perhaps that kind of sexual identity and yeah it's yeah. not a simple just like there's not just boys and just girls yeah. even you know within one even for me as a, a identifying as female yeah, there's, yes, there's it's not just there. binary, is it? No, no, that, no yeah. not at all. That's what this is a really good thing for, I think, parents, I think for partners, it's good for practitioners as well, um, whether they're GPs and they're the first port of call for mm. someone who's saying, I've got gender stuff and the person hasn't had, hasn't come across that before. Yeah. They whip out this gender bred person thing and then both people can focus on something other than either the sheer panic that yeah. someone might be coming yeah. across, yes. um, the distress that the person, the, um, the patient or the client is, mm. is presenting with, mm. and they're both focusing on something which comes of a, as a relief, I mm. think, for both of mm. them, that there's something you can talk about in that space yeah. that helps the, the practitioner feel a little bit more knowledgeable than mm. uh, they might otherwise do mm. and have mm. the language right in front mm. of them. So and even good. looking at something else rather than having that eye-to-eye -eye conversation which yes. can be, you know, just add another level of difficulty yes. for people when they're feeling really uncomfortable to have the kind of face-to-face -face conversation gives you something else to focus on. Because for that they might have for years been shutting down that part of themselves and shutting down their personality mm -hmm. so that they, they don't have too many rings on their onion mm -hmm. because they're too shy or fearful that people will see through them or see who they really are or or 
they'll somehow fail as a mm. person or you know there's a whole lot of that stuff so they may not have very many skills when it comes to communicating what's going on over yeah yeah and enormously confronting I can imagine there would be people who perhaps have just struggled with this for decades even before they actually absolutely get to a point of wanting to speak to somebody and that that's an awful lot of time spent trying to sort through and worrying about things in your own head before you get a chance to mm. let it out and speak to somebody else Exactly. Take enormous courage. So we have sort of touched on some of the issues that can cause difficulty for people in relation to this kind of dissonance, this gap in terms of somebody's identity and uh, inner identity and, and outward, what they feel they ought to be presenting to the world and how that might cause distress. What are some of the other issues that you see when people come to you sure. to discuss gender? The the framework is is one thing but and the oh my god what's going on for oh, me sort of oh. thing that's that's one but um coming out to family and particularly parents is a really big issue and coming out to fa to friends uh what that looks like how do you do it and that people uh when they come to see me have almost always done some form of google search to find out what it, what it means and yeah. what trans means and and People get bombarded with YouTube videos of this is how you do things. This, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you're transgender, therefore you need to take hormones, and then you need to have surgery, either top surgery or bottom surgery or both. Okay. And then if you're a trans woman, so that's someone who's transitioning to become a woman, they might want facial surgery and get rid of the Adam's apple, mm -hmm. and, and so mm -hmm. it goes on. And so people um, come to me, and you know, for trans men transitioning to become a man, um, they. Uh, sort of expected to need top surgery to have the mastectomy mm. so they've got a flat masculine chest. And I think one of the first things I have to do is to unpick all of that mm. and say, you know what, this is your journey, this is your identity, this is your core that you're choosing about how, how, how you're going to express that in the world. You don't have to do anything that anybody else does. You can do things your own way. And there's one particular very high profile um, trans woman um, who's based in Melbourne. I'm sure she wouldn't mind me describing that she she hasn't had any hormones, any surgeries or anything like that. She's absolutely fabulous mm. and um, a really strong leader in the community. Mm. Um, she's, I like that she's a pin-up girl for, um, for choosing your identity and choosing your expression of identity mm -hmm. without having to buy into all of the media stuff that's, yeah. that's going yeah. on. And that's that strange human need to put people in boxes again, isn't it? It's sort of yeah. just put, okay, you're a trans person, so this is your box and exactly. this is what it looks like. Exactly. And it's like, no, this is the whole point, is yes. that it's not about the boxes. We don't need to be in boxes. And I think that, you know, for me, and that's a conversation I have with people about identity in different senses in terms of, you know, their, their work and their goals and their aspirations and the things they're trying to achieve in life and how personal and how unique that is. Mm. And don't get caught up in what you think other people expect you to do or, yes. uh, you know, I, I am a CEO and therefore I must behave in this way and yes. I must look like this and I must, you know, because again, that authenticity is so important for our well-being. And again, that's a whole other conversation, but as a leader in the, you know, authenticity, where you're just describing a leader there in that, in the trans yes. community, and yes. the fact that she is very authentic and and different from and different, yeah. Yeah, because it's uh, it's about the categories. And I think in the 1980s, Boy George was su just caused such a storm because people were saying, is is it a we boy or a girl? Boy George with real masculine yeah. terms, and then yeah. the more feminine presentation. Yeah. And um, and I I, I love that I, I love the, the the gender bending mm. 1980s and mm. 90s kind of started to, to pave the way I think mm. for people who identified as something other than that real binary masculine yeah. feminine thing. Yeah, yeah that was a wonderful probably people lots of people have seen it was going around on Facebook but it was Pink the performer um, talking to up on stage but sort of directing a conversation to her daughter who was in the stage she concerned that she you know said oh I don't think I'm pretty or I you know I, I feel like I'm too boy like and she talked about she actually highlighted all of these wonderful people in the entertainment community who had been standouts in terms of this 
I didn't, you know, they were themselves, the David mm. Bowies and the Princes and, mm. and the Boy George and all these people who were just absolutely themselves. And we probably didn't, I don't think I appreciated that fully at the time, but looking back, you realise, yeah, they, they were making a huge difference. Yes. Um, in terms of telling society that there's more than just this or that. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. In fact, when I give talks, I often have pictures of those exact That's right, people. yes, I remember that. I remember <laughs> yeah, that now, right. yes. Um, so other things, I, I suppose, that uh, are issues for people when they come out is, are often about the expression of gender. Um, the social cues I was talking about where you sort of men hold doors open for women. Okay. Therefore, as a woman, if somebody's opening the door for you, you don't hesitate. You go through, you thank them and make a comment and you keep on going. Yep. It's not who's going to win by holding the door open mm. for longer, mm. you know, and it's uh, it's not even as visible as that. It's tiny little micro facial expressions. Subtle things. Yeah. They're real subtle stuff. Mm. So that's sometimes just alerting people to the fact that that's what happens. Another really big one is people, particularly, well, no, trans men and trans women, and I'm going to not talk about the non binary people who gloriously don't have to fit in any mm. boxes, but mm. for people who want to fit in the box that they weren't born in, the fact that their bodies are not going to look like a supermodel. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You know, trans men who are saying, I'm really small and I've got small hands and, I, and I, I don't have those square shoulders. And I say, go to the local shopping centre, sit in the food court and watch people go past because that's normal people. Mm. And that's normal people's bodies and mm. trans women. Yeah, your build is not slim. You're not... I don't say you're never going to be slim because then, you know, whatever. Yes. Um, that gets into feminist yes. issues then, <laughs> yes, doesn't it? it does. But it's at least model yourself on real people mm. so that you look at what people are wearing. What are women wearing when they are kind of broad-shouldered and bulky and they, um, you know, have big legs and big hips? What do they wear? Model yourself on that mm -hmm. so yeah. that you're trying to look like a regular folk yes. rather than a supermodel yes yes yeah. and that i think is such a actually wonderful advice probably for all of us <laughs> <laughs> just you know i do i know I've, I've mentioned that even to my kids and they're not they're still primary school so they haven't quite got into that side of things about you know i need to look a certain way but i know for me and again maybe because i'm a psychologist um you know yeah i, I stand in lifts and i sort of notice and i go actually the tall I'm taller here than the men in this oh, lift yes. you know yep. or and you do just get an appreciation I think for me I do yoga I've done yoga and I, I kind of you're not really paying attention to what other people are doing but every once in a while you're conscious that my body can easily do things that somebody else's can't yes. but then they can do things like how on earth do they even do that because I can't get my body to do that yep. in any way shape yep. or form and you really do realize how different even our physiology down to the level of you know tendons and, yeah. and bits that are you know so unique. And, and let's take that I don't do yoga because I started doing yoga and I'd look at everybody else's bodies and think oh my gosh I don't belong <laughs> here because I can't do those yeah, things yeah. Uh, my body won't do that so I do mm. other things that mm. um, suit my body mm. and I think it, you mm. know it, there's a good message there for everybody yes. there's a really good message there for trans folk as well if your body doesn't do this it doesn't fit into size seven shoes don't try and force them mm. and mm. if they don't then you don't have to wear heels if you're six mm. foot four. In no. fact, you know, I don't wear heels. I never heels wear heels. <laughs> because I am a taller woman yeah. and I don't like so heels. They're uncomfortable. Yeah, it's face right. That's it. It's uncomfortable. So you don't have to buy into those stereotypes yeah. either. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess that is, you know, I, we, I know we talk about that in terms of our, you know, as a woman, there's lots of conversations about the stereotype and how you look and what you wear. and But yes, that's a whole different perspective looking at it from someone who's perhaps. Who, physiologically being born you yes. know, male yeah. and then having to, you know, or thinking that you have to, because it is always about That's thinking right. that you have to adhere to these things, not because you actually do, you totally don't, exactly. but thinking that you do and yeah, and, yeah that mess that creates in your mind. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Any other issues that you see present or people present with, particularly in relation to their well-being and mental health? Um, I, I think there's a 
There's a problem to some extent where pe some people think that they want to ultimately end up being stealth, they call people call it, um, where no one know no one knows that they're transgender, mm -hmm. that they are passing fully as a man or as a woman, and that that is kind of considered the gold standard mm. of um, you know you've succeeded as a transgender person okay. because you you're stealth, you just went from one box to the other box that they didn't want yeah, to say. Exactly, and I, I think there's a real problem with that. One of them is it's really hard to maintain, and then the fear of being outed is just as intense mm. as it was beforehand mm -hmm. when someone's trying mm. to kind of come out as transgender but also the more we know about transgender the more profile that people who are trans or gender diverse have the more society gets used to differences in mm. presentation mm -hmm. and the more that happens the more our brains start to be more flexible about what's binary yeah. what's not binary yeah. um, and it's like less of that confusion yeah it's mm. it's and the sexuality thing with with gay and lesbian people being so accepted now is because uh there's been profile there's been yeah. people um out in public and yep comfortable yeah. doing so and becoming good role models for the future and so in fact yeah i was i was reading the latest copy of our ballarat lifestyle magazine which is one of the local sort of i call it glossy because it's a beautiful matte paper <laughs> but you know sort of a lovely magazine and in it there was a couple of local couples same-sex couples who had married so since the beginning of the year when we had yeah. changes in the in the law and my boys who were nine and six were sitting there on the floor going, what are you reading, what are you reading? And I looked at it and I showed them and I, I sort of explained, oh, it's just people getting married. And I didn't say anything more about it. There's a photo of two women getting married, there's a photo of two men getting married. And, um, and they didn't think anything of it as well. And, and in my mind, I was thinking, you know, this will be so different for them because they won't have that confusion. Two women get married, two men get married. You know, yeah. what's what's the big deal? And, and hopefully, again, with you know, growing up as this generation, um, with transgender or gender diversity, equally they won't have that confusion yes. that we've had growing up only because we were taught that there was one box or the other box. Yes, mm. and I think one of the um, wonderful things that I've I've heard a story from a couple of transgender people. I run a support group here, and it is that they've been sufficiently confident to be out as trans even if they haven't had any of the treatments mm -hmm. if you want to call it that and gone out to a shoe shop and looked the shoe shop person in the eye mm -hmm. who took a step back and this person said yeah I'm transgender I'm, I've got really big feet do you reckon you can help me with um, finding some size 11 shoes that would look really nice mm. and I'm just at the start of my journey and mm. the the woman was able to ask questions mm. they both had a proper real conversation yeah and both people ended up richer for it yeah. because it was um, an opportunity for education of a, a shop assistant who from then on would probably be alert to it mm. and in a positive kind of mm. way and for the trans woman who had done this uh, a positive experience too I'm fronting yeah. you up I'm looking you in the eye and I'm unashamedly who I am you with a practical problem like anybody else might yeah and that that then becomes a really positive interaction anybody mm. else in the shop would have noticed the same thing and noticed the interaction yep. and that's a positive experience yeah. for them as well Wonderful. so it's it's, yeah. a, it's a great thing to do yeah. you've actually reminded me when I was probably 19 or 20, I worked in the jewellery department of a department store and I had somebody come to me who presented as a woman, looked like a woman, coming to buy earrings and there was sort of an awkwardness about the conversation as this person came up to me and she sort of, and she pulled out a photo out of her wallet and I can't remember because it was so long ago, this was sort of 25 years ago now, but the essence of it basically was this is me in the photo and it's a photo of a man, this is me now now as I am and I really need some help picking out the right earrings. And I remember feeling a you know, momentary confusion but then thinking, okay, I just have to help this person pick out a pair of earrings in the yes. same way and I did and, and that was... 
I don't, maybe I, I don't know whether I even had a concept of transgender at the time. I mean, this is. Do you know what yeah. your brain just did at that point? It rewired. Yeah. So it was binary. Yeah. We've been brought up for binary. Yeah. And at that precise moment, which is probably why there was a pause, because there were about fifty thousand new neural yes. connections <laughs> going on. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. Um, your brain suddenly understood that there was uh, another another way. Another, yeah. Mm. yeah. 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 So bravo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time. But I, I do. You know, thinking back, that really was. I, I can still remember that exact moment, and maybe that was because I was rewiring my neurons at yes, that point. Yes. I can still remember what, what this woman looked like, I can still remember where I was standing, and, and the feelings that went with, and that realisation that, okay, this is just another customer who wants to find earrings, and I'm going to try. But I think, too, there was a part of me who wanted to help, because I think I appreciated even then that this was... An awkward, you know, I think she yes. was a bit, felt a bit awkward. Yes. I therefore felt a bit awkward, but I was quickly able to say or, or realise at some level that, you know, this person perhaps needed my help even more so than, than, a, than, than, a, than many of the other yeah. customers that I'd served. Yes. So, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's a success, isn't it? Yeah, well, it is now. I'm thinking back. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, Madeline, I'm, I'm interested to know from your perspective, what is it that you want other people out there in the community to know. I mean, I know you do talk on this topic out, out um, publicly as well as running support groups and helping individuals. What's the key message you really like other people to know that will be more helpful both for the you know, members of the trans community but for all of us? Yep. Look, I think the main thing is that people don't choose to have gender dysphoria. They don't choose to have a mismatch between what they were born with and what's in their brain as a sense mm. of identity. Mm. So, you know, they're not making it up. It doesn't go away if someone, uh, um, often it's a parent says, no, you're not, you're just gay. Still, or, yeah. no, you're not, this is, you're a just, this is a phase you're going through, exactly. Mm. It's not one of those things that you would actively choose because it no. is a tough path. Yeah. yeah. So if somebody were to, um, be told that they, that someone they know is is has gender diversity, to accept that that is right for that person at that time. Now it might be a phase. Statistically, a lot of children who identify as the other gender. Um, will kind of realign through, I'm sure it's a process of that social socialisation, mm. you know, they'll realign with their birth gender, with their birth sex. Mm. So statistically it does happen. In teenagers, not so much. Okay. Yeah. And in adults, almost never. So by the time you've got to those teenage years yes. and adulthood, if you're yes. feeling that dissonance, that disconnection, then that's yeah. likely to be there to stay. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. So, and the other thing I suppose for people is that the individual is not changing who they are. They're just changing their outward expression mm. of who they mm. are. That core is the same. Yeah, the core is the same. So, you know, I know that um, parents often will have a, a real sense of deep grief that they've lost their son or they've lost their daughter and their hopes for their daughter or their son have been shattered. And that's true and mm. real. Mm. They haven't lost their child, mm. they haven't lost the person, they've just lost all of those social things that they had mm. expected and hoped for their child. And that's really about them too, isn't it? Yeah. That's about being the parent, <laughs> it's not actually about the child, yeah. it's yeah. me letting go of my vision of what the future would look like, yes. but yeah, that's, that's completely separate to what the, the child themselves is going through and what they need. Exactly, mm. exactly. Mm. Yeah. So that to me is the main take home message yeah mm. fabulous look this has been a fascinating amazing conversation i've thoroughly enjoyed it um i will pop the a link perhaps to the gender bread person and any other resources that you think might be helpful to people sure. in the show notes so that people can kind of follow up and follow through where can people find you if they're interested well, I'm at Sound Psychology Ballarat, yep. and uh, in fact, if you Google Ballarat and Madeline Fernbach, my uh, or, or or rather transgender and Ballarat, that my name you comes pop up. up. Okay, um, but that's probably the best way is, is through there, I think. Yep. Mm. Yeah. And what? So you run support groups locally. Um, you see people individually as clients yes and look there's talk of me writing a book but I'm oh, not sure how that's how that's going. Going. <laughs> well look if that happens
Lorenzo, I will have you back on to talk about the book. I think that, yeah, it would be an amazing contribution to um, those of us who want to understand more, you know, to have your, your insight and have all of that written in book form. And um, I do love to talk about a book with an author <laughs> on the podcast. So okay. we'll see. I think well, that'll be some time down there. It'll the be a little while off, but that's all right. That's all right. We've got plenty of time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that really thoughtful, insightful and quite frank interview with Dr. Madeleine Fernbach. I wonder if it's got you thinking about your identity, your personal and public personas, and what it means to you to live a truly authentic life. Maybe you've learned something about gender diversity, stereotypes and social identity. I know I have. I've put links to the genderbred person that Madeline and I discuss in the show notes for this episode. Pop over to potential.com.au forward slash podcast to find it. There you'll also find some further insightful resources on gender and gender diversity. If you're new to the Potential Psychology Podcast, I invite you to go back and listen to the great guests I've interviewed so far this season and in season one. We've covered digital parenting, building confidence, the woman's brain, helping kids to manage stress and anxiety, psychology and yoga, tips for productivity, and how to overcome adversity and emerge happier and stronger. You'll find every episode in iTunes, on Stitcher, and via your favourite podcast players. And now, too, on Google Podcasts. While you're there, I'd love it if you could leave a rating and review as this spreads the word about the podcast and gives me and the team great feedback on what's working well. If you haven't already, you might also like to join the Potential Psychology community by signing up to my regular newsletter at potential.com.au forward slash subscribe. This will keep you up to date with the latest podcast episodes and blog posts, link you up to top articles in positive psychology, performance and well-being, and give you the behind the scenes here at Potential Psychology HQ. In episode 17 of the podcast, I'm interviewing someone a little different. My guest will be Dr. Joseph Sweeney, who's not a psychologist. He's a writer, an educator, an industry advisor, and his research explores how humans work with the tools of technology. He's currently writing a book with the working title, The Future of Work, and that's exactly what we'll be exploring in our upcoming discussion. Here's Joe to tell you a little more. We have this blind spot about what really matters in how we use technology in education and in fact what the technology will look like in the future and how our children will interact with it and how that will then move forward into, into their adult life. I'm exceedingly concerned with what I see. I'm a technologist and I think that we're overplaying the technology hand in a lot of these spaces. I really look forward to exploring the future of work with you and Dr Joe Sweeney. Until then, have an amazing week and thanks for listening.